Thank you, Josh. That was a very generous introduction. Um, so I really have two main jobs today. I could just do them quickly and sit down. The first is to apologize for not being Darren Walker, um, who was supposed to have done this uh, lunchtime speech and um, really, really was sorry not to be able to be with you. Um, and the second is just to say unequivocally, um, Ford Foundation's existing and um, future support for this kind of effort and this, uh, this kind of work. I think what, you, you know, what this conversation is about, and I love the way that Tony, where this is becoming a theme here, uh, talked about um, sort of the, what it means to get better at getting better, um, is really, really uh, critically important. So those are the two most important messages that I wanted to say today, but I'm gonna also just talk a little bit about um, how we at the Ford Foundation are thinking about these issues, both for ourselves as a foundation, but then also for some of the kinds of broader questions. I think it raises about philanthropy's role in um, supporting an infrastructure for learning and continuous improvement um, in our fields. So, um, Saying yes to this conference was the easiest thing I've done this whole year. When Josh and, and uh, Frank and Lee appeared in my office to say, you know, we've got these ideas. And what I find so exciting about this is that it, it feels as if it is beginning to move away from, I think, what has been a counterproductive period of time of almost like evidence wars. You know, are there some better ways of knowing um, how to get better at getting better than other, than other ways? And um, you know, I think we need, as the paper very clearly says, we need many ways. And we need many ways um, for lots of reasons. And funders need to understand that we need many ways and not only one way. Um, because uh, in many, many ways, and this is funders um, in foundations, but it's also funders in governments, state, local, and federal governments, because um, you know, I think you are talking very convincingly here today about the importance of capacities for, um, for learning, networks of people who are passionate about learning and using evidence to get better at what they do, and the infrastructure that it takes to support that. And that's a really, really different approach to thinking about what is needed to achieve um, social impact than thinking about interventions and thinking about models. So I think that's one really important um, thing that this represents, and we're really happy to support it. But I think the other reason that it's important among many, um, is that we all are working to solve really, really tough problems um, in very complex systems where, as Alice talked about this morning, we've had disappointing progress, you know, if we're honest with ourselves for the years and effort and money um, that have been spent. And that, and because we very, very often, I think, as a field, don't take a kind of systems approach. We don't allow ourselves to have a broad enough lens to think about the complexity of what change requires. We perpetuate a very negative kind of um, feedback loop, uh, the kind of thing that people in systems thinkers would systems thinking would call fixes that backfire. Uh, mass incarceration would be a perfect example. You know, where you set out with a thing you think is going to solve a problem, um, but it ends up actually creating unintended negative consequences that are worse than the problem um, that it set out to solve. And I think um, philanthropy is, is a part of that kind of problem because it loves to fund the new, new thing. It loves to fund the innovation and it, it gets infatuated with its own vision of what those kinds of models and innovations can be. And uh, it has a very short, it shouldn't have, but it does have a very, very short attention span. Um, and so it, for, it forgets, it, it never bothers to know too often, it never bothers to know what has been learned by things that have been tried before. So if you take the kind of rigor and passion that we heard in the panels this morning and in Tony's words and you think about the reflections that Alice gave us, those were really about going up from an individual organization or a set of kinds of interventions or problems to think about um, an enterprise, which is an enterprise we are all part of the doers and the funders um, and the learners, and trying to help ourselves get better at having um, memory and uh, allowing there to be that kind of continuous um, improvement with a much, broader, a much broader lens. So, you know, I wanted to just talk for a brief minute about what I think, um, what, what should be philanthropy's role in trying to help um, solve this problem, that kind of a problem. Uh, 
And, you know, I alluded to one uh, piece of it, and that is our attention span. Um, you know, we, uh, we have the benefit of not being elected. <laughs> um, we don't have to respond to market pressures. We should have the ability to take a long attention span, but we, um, we too often don't. We, we too often don't. And there are easy things to, to um, we can all love to kind of beat up on foundations about that. I did that for 22 years. But, is it, but it is actually a serious problem. And I'm looking at Kathleen Enright from GEO who convened a group of about 12 foundations at Ford's office last month. Uh, and there were probably 12 foundations there and I would say that about three quarters of us were either in the middle of or about to finish um, some sort of process of strategy, re strategy rethink and organizational redevelopment. And you know, you thought, you, you, you sat in that room and you understood why. These are institutions that want to get better at what they do, but attached to them are grantees. And if you think about grantees who probably get there, who are trying to solve hard problems uh, in complex situations, and if you think about the numbers of those grantees that are probably attached to more than one of those foundations that are in transition and strategy development, you have a system that spins and swirls in a way that um, is probably you know more than it needs to. And so there are a lot of bad reasons why that happens, but there are some good reasons for why that happens. And those are those are the reasons that cause foundations themselves to step back and say periodically. Are we, do, are we using, the, making the highest and best use of our unique resources? What are we learning from things we've tried? And if we have tried things and done things and funded things, to Angela's question earlier, what do we stop? And how do we stop responsibly? And how do we learn um, and share our learning responsibly? And um, that actually turns out to be a really hard problem to, uh, to solve well. And I don't think that we are good enough um, at doing that. And we don't have enough external pressures, but we do have boards. And boards are, um, it's hard to get them to think about these kinds of issues well. Um, you know, the Ford Foundation is a, quote, social justice foundation. That means we have a board that is used to thinking about things like changing belief systems and changing power dynamics and um, changing rules of the game. We're not, we're not a foundation that tends to be a very model-driven um, foundation. But we still have board members who will say, like they have said to our new president, tell me one thing, just one thing when I, in, that I can count on in my term on this board that I will know we have actually made a difference on. And so, you know, those are, those are um, kinds of questions that cause us to, need, to have the same needs you do for being able to think about a framework to help people understand what it means to, um, to learn. So a couple of things that we at least are doing at Ford in addition to asking ourselves these questions and trying to answer them in a responsible way. Um, one of the things that we've done over the course of this year, I have responsibility also for our very small grant making program that is about philanthropy itself, is we've joined together with a group of other foundations, six of us, to create something called the Fund for Shared Insight. And it is a, uh, uh, has issued a request for proposals that we have pooled resources. We have about five million dollars, and it is uh, it has requested thinking from the field about the use of feedback loops that would um, use the voices of people, the people we aim to serve, put them at the center, and get much better at getting that kind of feedback and using it um, to improve practice. So we. Uh, I, I'm leaving early today because we're making our first round of decisions based on the first round of proposals that we've received tomorrow. And we got, we got almost 200 proposals in response to a, an RFP that was out for a very short period of time. And we had three categories for it. The first was to fund um, research, ways of doing research like Tony's, uh, that, use, that will advance the use of feedback loops, um, particularly feedback loops from the people um, whose systems are trying to serve. Uh, the second was a set of strategies that might help foundations themselves increase their own openness and transparency. Uh, and the third was uh, uh, funding that would support the practice of using feedback loops um, in social service organizations to improve their delivery. And 70% of all the proposals we got were for that third category, for the practice, for the doing of it. So there's an enormous, um, an enormous, that's over 127 um, proposals. So there's an enormous interest in that. There's an enormous, it, it is not the case that the quote, social service sector is not interested in understanding um, how to do better at what it does. What there aren't is adequate 
resources um, coming from philanthropy to support their ability to ask those questions and, um, and answer them well. So that's one thing I think that foundations can do is to begin to ask themselves how, what can we do to uh, change our own behavior and what can we do to um, support developing the kind of infrastructure that this meeting um, is trying to put forward. So it's, uh, I know there, I am not the only, we, I think we have a number of um, foundations here looking around the room, and I think we have an enormous opportunity to listen with you, to learn with you, and to think about what we can do to be more supportive and, um, and more urgent about helping us all get better at getting better, because that, in the end, is the key question. So, thank you. If Hillary is willing, and I sure. think she is, uh, let's see if there are any questions. Thank you, Hillary, for those remarks. Um, any questions? Uh, because what we're beginning now, and Hillary started us off in a great way, is to talk about what would it take to put in place the kind of approach, the infrastructure that um, people have been alluding to. So any questions for Hillary? Marty. Hey, Martin. So we've seen a lot of resources from um, hedge funds and the corporate, the business entrepreneurs in the philanthropic sector, if you will, very much driven in, a, for, as I perceive it, mm -hmm. in a different direction. Right? We want results. We want solutions. Give them to a short term. Give them immediately. Does, how, does, how do you see that and how does Ford interact with that you know, sort of theory of action that is yeah. not only in conflict with the social justice ideas that you, you articulated, but also even to some extent with some of the improvement work, although there might be debate about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think a lot of the new wealth coming into philanthropy, which is going to swamp the old um, foundations like the Ford Foundation, comes from people who see the world in a really different way. And having worked at the Gates Foundation, you know, where what Bill Gates would apply, say about himself with pride, is I'm a technocrat. I'm a technocrat. But you know, Tony's slide, that slide about improvement, which the Gates Foundation funded, would be the way Bill Gates' mind works to his great credit. So he is re relentlessly, restlessly trying to figure out how to make it better, how to make it better, how to make it better. And to his credit, and I think many people like him, they are in fact learners. Um, and they are, they have an amazing nose for um, trying to figure out uh, the assumptions people and systems have. And then, you know, is the change thing doing what we thought it would do? Is it doing what we thought it would do? So I think, I think we have to get much more effective because when we fight each other and we're and we're, we confuse the hell out of people like that, you know, should it be an RCT trial? Should it be this way of evaluating? Should it be that way of evaluating? People like that are impatient, so they want rapid feedback loops. Um, they believe in the kinds of things that um, that Tony was talking about, networks of practice that are strongly evidence based. So I think a lot of it is how we actually articulate the value proposition and. Um, how we can help show uh, work and practice that helps things get much better, much faster. Because they're much more interested in the kinds of questions that Tony is asking than they are in the traditional, we want to work on something for uh, 50 years. They want to solve something in their lifetimes. So they need this kind of work. Nina. Nina Cesar O'Donnell, the National Results and Col uh, Equity Collaborative. A lot of um, the work that's going on in local communities involving multiple partners and collective impact um, is affected by the mindset that the professionals and the philanthropists bring into the room from multiple perspectives. And so I'm wondering in the work that you're doing or that you know about, it, in thinking about how to create the right infrastructure for changing how we think about this, are people looking at higher ed? Because the way people come into the field, whether they're a business major or a social worker or a pediatrician, if they don't get um, knowledge on how to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and how to think about learning as a continuous part of their professional 
practice, we're always going to be playing catch up yeah. because we're going to have to keep you know, reorienting people. So I'm curious to know in, in what you're seeing, mm. if you're seeing anybody thinking about that issue. I'd say there's a tiny handful of foundations that um, of foundations that think about that, but I think that question really is a question that should be put to the institutions of higher learning. I mean, that, that seems to me to be very core and central to their public mission and very much falling off the table. Question back here. Olivia. Thank you. I'm Olivia Golden at CLASP, Center for Law and Social Policy. Um, and this is actually a compliment to Ford, but a question about other funders. Um, <laughs> oh, darn. I was actually going to, I was going to say it even if it had been somebody else. So um, as you know, um, one of the things that we've been doing in partnership with the Urban Institute and Center on Budget is work for several years with six states mm -hmm. that are dramatically improving how they deliver Medicaid and SNAP benefits. And the part that's relevant to this is the work on data systems and not just on systems, there's a huge amount of federal money right now to improve the systems, but on this issue of how do you build the capacity to actually use it when you've attrited all the people who used to be able to translate between the computer people and the operations people or the policy people, and how do you create the culture and how do you avoid the idea that it's all going to be blame. And what I think that has shown about Ford's investment is that when a funder gets over the perspective that state governments are full of bureaucrats and bad people who don't want to learn and just want to do the same thing over and over and starts to get into the meat that in some ways it's astonishingly cheap to help people. Yeah. They're affecting hundreds of thousands or millions of families with a tiny number of staffs who aren't doing direct service. So I'm curious about your view of to what degree funders in general are affected by perspectives on who's open to learning? Who is it that you could invest in and get openness? And how do you change that? Well, that's a great question. So I'm going to say something that will probably offend half the people in this room. But um, I think one of the negative consequences of the infatuation of everyone, but especially philanthropy, with social entrepreneurship in these this last couple of decades has been that all of those fields derive from the argument that government is failing um, and that they are going to be somehow smarter about um, uh, working a niche um, and, and putting a solution in place. And that can be true, but in almost every single one of those cases, their path to scale lies through government funding and government policy. And so I think, you know, what would it be if foundations were as interested in figuring out what entrepreneurship looks like in the public sector, in state governments and in local governments. And you know, there are some, so I think any foundation like Robert Wood Johnson or Annie E. Casey that works on systems, they tend to um, be great funders who think about things like that. Uh, but I think we, you know, we have a lot of work to do to make that idea more sexy and more compelling. Um, so. Yeah, this. <laughs> So that was that half of the room. Yeah, right. The <laughs> that was my easy question. And, and I think it was more than half, Hillary. Let's see if there's a final question. Uh, no, all right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Over here. Yes. When you give someone a grant, and particularly like a, a, a local, either a community organization or a local school district or something like that, how much do you look at how that is integrated into their overall uh, plan for how they're going going forward? Because you hear all of these things about a school or a community group that has 18 different grants from 18 different people, and they all have their own right. requirements, and so they get kind of overloaded on compliance rather than actually doing what they need to do. How do you guys plan for that? Yeah, Karen Pittman and I were talking about that in the break, and she was talking about work that they are doing with Baltimore, where finally people in the school district of Baltimore are getting ready to meet with the um, foundation-funded evaluators and intermediaries. We're like, wait a minute. How come we're already getting, always getting ready to answer their questions? <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we come to them with our questions and get them to answer our questions? And so I think that is another great example of a dynamic that... Um, 
that needs to change. And, you know, when you think about it, the changing any big problem is going to take way more years than, you know, every, whatever group of foundations funds the thing, um, they're going to change their minds and stop funding it sometime during the period of time it takes to change it. Staff will change in the foundations and in the organizations that are doing the work. So I think somehow we have to have a more um, realistic timeline for what true change takes and, and put the, you know, kind of the users uh, more at the center. We, one of um, the evaluation people that I loved working with at, uh, at the Gates Foundation, Kendall Guthrie, when we were um, funding any group of grants, particularly on things that were somewhat char controversial like charter schools, she would bring, before she created an evaluation design and put it out for competition, she would bring the public sector decision makers um, who would use that evaluation results into the room first and say, what, what would you need to learn from this evaluation that would cause you to change something, you know, adopt the innovation, change the practice that you're doing, and then she would try to backwards design the evaluation from that. So I think you raise a very important problem, and, you know, that's a good example, I think, as, as I hope you all and we all begin thinking about what would be productive lines of um, shared activity, because I, I think it does have to be people from the systems um, having, giving, giving themselves much more agency and much more power. Uh, and, and foundations giving them that too, but we have a pretty dysfunctional mm -hmm. dynamic right now. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary, for very much. <laughs>